1976, <clears throat> I was national chairman of the AIA convention, American Institute of Architects convention, <clears throat> which occurred in Philadelphia. Now, as I said earlier in this talk, unless you edit it out, I don't belong to anything. I'm not a member of anything. I'm not on the boards of anything. I'm not vice president of this or on this committee. No company has had me on the board. I don't belong to any faculties. I mean, on and on and on, right? <clears throat> and I certainly did not. I belong to the AIA because it was what you, you would just join. You were part of the AIA when you became basically a registered architect. 1976, I was younger. I'm 74 now, but seven, 1976 is a while ago, even for me, right? <clears throat> And I hadn't joined any committees in the AA. Didn't, uh, I wasn't any, anything in the local chapter. I wasn't a committee member or a vice president of anything. But I was a force to be reckoned with. And when the National decided to have their annual conference in Philadelphia because of the bicentennial, 76 in Philadelphia, they somehow couldn't, it's not that they wanted me, but they couldn't avoid making me chairman. They just couldn't avoid it. What they didn't understand was in the fine print of the bylaws of the AIA, which I read, the chairman actually has a lot of power. In the past, they chose a chairman sort of honorifically, and he welcomed everybody and introduced the keynote speaker and got invited to the parties and sit at the head table. <laughs> Well, it turns out the chairman really had power. Half the AIA, half the paid members of the AIA, were there to put on meetings and conferences during the year. That's what professional organizations do. They put on meetings and conferences. And I, as soon as I was made chairman and it was public, I said, I'm not gonna have any meetings in any hotel. I don't care what your agreements are. I'm not going to have any meals in any hotels, and I'm not going to have the opening in the hotel or the, the keynote or the closing party. So whatever deals you have, give them back the kickbacks you've gotten and leave me alone. Okay? That didn't go over well, but I had the power to do it. So where was I going to have my hundred meetings and have all my friends like Jonas and all these people come in from around the country? It was, in a sense, my first TED experiment in 76, well before 84. I said to all my other friends in Philly, the heads of banks, the heads of insurance companies, the heads of all businesses that all had offices in Philadelphia at that time in the downtown, for the week of the conference, I want your boardroom. And I'm gonna have all my meetings for 30 or 40 people. Give me chairs and give me snacks too. I'm going to have them in all the boardrooms around the city and there'll be a great program and maps of the city of how to get around and people are going to go up through buildings to your boardroom, see the city, see what people do, meet people throughout the city, get to know the city and I'm going to make the city a schoolhouse for that year, for that week rather. I'm not going to have a party in a hotel. I'm going to have Eugene Ormandy, the great composer, the great conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra, We'll have a great concert by him at the end. And after that's over, we'll all come out to the front of the Academy of Music. And I'm gonna shoot fireworks off from the tops of three big buildings. And then we're gonna come back into the Academy of Music, go to their rehearsal rooms, which are huge, and have a great ball, right? I went to the Curtis School of Music and I said, I want all the people, all the little string quartets you have. I'll pay each string quartet a hundred bucks. I want them in the shop. When all the shops then had deep storefronts. I want them playing chamber music around the city as people, everybody walks through the city. And I called the conference the Architecture of Information, Information Architecture. And I decided instead of having a keynote, I would write a fable gets to the story. And I wrote a fable about a fictional city and country, which was our city and our country at that time, because in 76 there was a recession, called What If, name of the city, comma, could be the name of the country, an historical fable of the future. 
And the main character of the fable was the commissioner of curiosity and imagination, who was me. I didn't spare my ego. And he comes into the city because he's allowed to do whatever he wants for one year. And whatever he wants, like the chairman of the conference, he can get done, but for a year. And he does the opposite to what I've already talked about. So this is all thematic, right? The first thing he does is change the laws of copyright to the right to copy, right? And the only thing that you could keep on copyright, copywriting were bad ideas. Those you can't let out. He changed the IQ test, which was testing all the kids, to the SOH test, the sense of humor test. And even the people who couldn't pass it couldn't laugh about it. He changed all zoning to, instead of zoning buildings, he zoned the streets and public property. Therefore, he could zone the trucks out of there by time and the traffic moved. He could zone traffic and he could zone by zoning the streets. He zoned the access that you could have. By zoning access, you actually tell you what kind of land use you can have different places. And there was no zoning variances because it wasn't in private hands. He closed basically all the city departments and he created only one new city department and that was the department of waiting to be wanted and that was dedicated to old buildings and old people, right? Well, it goes on and on and on and on and on. It was a little teeny book. I gave it away. I never sold it. In the last nine months, ten months, I was thinking about this and I talked about it at a speech and I said, and I have a sequel in my head. And some people said, we really like you to do that. So I got encouraged. And so next Monday and Tuesday, the sequel is being printed. And the sequel is called 33. And that's because it starts 33 years after the commissioner was banished <laughs> from the first book. It's 33 years later. And he was banished because everything worked so well that the city fathers were out of work. They didn't need them. So as soon as his year was up, they banished him. And they banished him, they spun the globe, threw a dart, and they banished him as far as they could to a little atoll in the South Pacific Micronesian group called the Carolinian Islands, south of Ponape, to an atoll called Kapangi Morangi. And there he was for 33 years, had 33 children, 200 people living there. The head of the island was Andrew Lucky and then Andrew Lucky's son. And he was happy as hell. Through uh, Facebook and this book and through connections and YouTube, the young people now, 33 years later, who weren't alive when he was around, go into his story and they want him back to help save what if and could be again, because it's broken. Are we living in broken times? So they take a trip around the world, they go to Ponape, they go have to wait a week because there's only a steamer that goes one, once a month down past uh, uh, Kapanki Morangi, 470 miles south. They go on the steamer, there's no, there's no place to tie up, this little boat comes out and in it is the commissioner. And they tell him, oh, how bad everything is. The finances, the schools, the crime, the and he is completely uninterested. Because he never really was interested. He just wanted this game of, of uh, doing the opposite and seeing solutions. He really didn't care about the people, he just, but he was iconic by that time. They had bobbleheads with him and everything. And then they mentioned television. He said, I really miss television. What's going on with television? And they tell him, oh, all the things with flat screens and thinner than flat screens and organic screens and huge screens and full color and high def and 150, 250 channels and TiVo and Super TiVo and on demand. He says, I'll come back if you give me a big flat screen because I love television, which as you know, I love television. Yeah. I would say that every year at my conference just to freak people out. I said, I love television. Because you're not allowed to say it, right? <laughs> so they come back 
And he lives this year, and that's what the fable is. He lives this year, after he comes back, as a 33-episode TV series. Right? Now, by the way, Kapangi Marangi is real. Ponape is real. Everything I've told you is real. Okay? 470 miles is real. Each degree of latitude is 60 or 70 miles. That's all in the book. All these factoids are in the book, and it's all about science and stuff. It's all, it's all true. Of course, the story is not true. Uh, look up Kapangi Marangi. They have their own language called Kapangi. One of the few, one of the, there's not that many languages still in the world. They used to be. And um, he goes through this, uh, this year with all his ideas and he has about these lies I told you and he has about uh, just everything that's going on. And he's 75 years old. I made him a year older than me because people probably won't buy the book till next year. <laughs> not for Christmas? <laughs> no, it's not going to be. It's not, it's not a book for many people who are not mm -hmm. printing very many. This is not, mm -hmm. this is not my cause celeb, believe me. <laughs> I'm doing it just because I want to do it. Anyway, uh, He sees when he comes back that the, uh, some things he thought were good weren't so good when he left. Some things he thought were bad were good. Um, so he changed his mind about some things. He, I do say that the end of the first fable was corny. You know, is this the end of the beginning? It's like a dumb valedictorian, right? So I said, the ending to this one will be glib but not bad. And I tell what the ending is. And the ending is understanding is power. And then I take you to the ending of how you get there. And he sees that somebody has uh, won the primaries as the new commander in chief, and that he's going to be put into office. And he doesn't meet him, but he sends him a note and says, I'm 75. Of course, he's known. Everybody knows him because he's iconic. And uh, time is more important to me than ever. And one of the first things I looked at when I came back commander in chief is, I don't like our calendar. There's two months that are bad for several reasons. July and August are named for despots, Julius Caesar and Augustus. And by putting them in the calendar, we make September, which means seven, the ninth month. October, which means eight. Everything's out of order. December means 10, and we make it the 12th month. This is dumb. And I can't remember which month has 30 days or 31 days. So I've come up with a new calendar, which I'm adopting, and I have the power to do this this year. And it's, uh, every month has 33 days. 33, mm -hmm. name of the book. Yeah. And I'm gonna create one new month after December, which is December is now the 10th month. So the 11th month is gonna be called Remember. And that's a month of public service where we remember our parents, the people who helped us, the people less fortunate than ourselves. It's a month of public service. And then we only have two days left over and it's right around New Year's, I'll call it Bender. <laughs> and leap year we have a three day Bender. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the commander in chief gets inaugurated on the 33rd day of January. So the commissioner fills out his year in office and at the very end of his year, the Commander-in-Chief, I'm skipping 32 episodes, the Commander-in-Chief invites him to join his chest of drawers, his cabinet, right? And he creates this new position as the Secretary of Understanding. The Commissioner thinks, well, I'm an old fart. He's given me this job. It doesn't really amount to anything, right? Am I still on the frame there? Yes, yes. Okay, I haven't left town or anything, no. okay? Sorry. And um, he realizes, though, in his first day of office, that the work of every other secretary comes across his desk because they all want it made understandable. And that understanding is power. That's the ending from that I told in the beginning. But then there's one more page in the book. His, 
kind of epilogue. He realizes in this first session of the Chester Bros, there was only two things talked about, healthcare and wealth care, kissing cousins. I won't tell you the whole thing, but he ends by saying, so I thought about, what if my knee hurts? Well, I can get a cane, or I can get a new knee, and I can have it made of titanium or ceramic, or I can put this new plastic plug in it. I know the doctors won't tell me of the excruciating pain that you go through as you recover. I can uh, rub it with liniment. I can take one of 1,219 pain pills. I can worship to some god in some church somewhere and through reading holy scriptures of some sort, get rid of the pain. Or I could belong to a religion that says you don't do anything about any ills. Or if I'm very old, I do nothing about it. Or I limp and use it as a means of starting a conversation with people. Or I can move to a warmer climate or a drier climate. Or I can move to a place where everybody's knees hurt and then it doesn't mean so much, right? Or I can have whatever I want paid for by some of my family or by the government or by insurance. Or if I'm quite indulgent and rich, I could have four people carry me, right? I can get a wheelchair or a Segway. But what I'm really finding out is everything I can do, none of them are esoteric, they're all understandable. And you can't universally prescribe what kind of care you should get. So you can't have universal health care. Because a 1,500 page document can't tell you how to treat your knee. We should have universal quality of life. And maybe we're not spending enough money on that. That if you spend money on anything, it should be on the quality of your life. Not just on keeping you alive and bankrupting the country, but in the quality of the life you live. And that's the end of the book.